I'm in the Hare and Hound in Kings Heath, which is a great pub, but it's also a fantastic venue. And there's a plaque outside from 1979 that says it was the first gig of one of the legendary Birmingham bands. So with me for this show is guitarist and singer Robin Campbell. All right, Des, how are you? I'm good, man. Good, good to see you again. And you. And it's great that you've taken time out. I know you're really busy. Absolute pleasure. So, yeah, and so how's it going? Good. We need to get back into the studio. We've just finished uh, a leg in Germany and Belgium and Holland of touring, you know. So uh, we're constantly touring forever, um, which means we don't get the album finished, you know. We've been promising to finish the album for the last 12 months. Um, but, you know, we're, in the next few days we'll get back in. We've got about six weeks, I think, right. uh, before we go back out. And is it, is it new stuff? Is it yeah. uh, covers or...? or? No, well, there may be... There, there's always one, maybe two covers. Yeah. Um, but, it, yeah, it's, it's mainly um, original material. Because I remember, I remember talking to Brian ages ago and he was saying that, like, Red Red Wine, when you did that, and you'd learnt it from like a white label that came over from, from uh, the West Indies. You didn't even know it was written by Neil Diamond, did you? No, I had no idea at all. I knew two versions. I knew the Jimmy James and the Vagabonds version, which is a 68 or something like that, 60, yeah. 69, uh, which was obviously an R&B soul type version. Um, and I knew the Tony Tribe version, right. which was uh, as sort of very early reggae um, and I had absolutely no idea on my single I still have the seven inch yeah that I bought in the 60s um, and on my single it says in brackets underneath uh, underneath Tony tribe breaded wine it says N diamond and <laughs> I was so up on Neil diamond that uh, I assumed it was Negus diamond or somebody <laughs> yeah. I had no idea you know in fact I had no interest in who had written it yeah. um, yeah. It wasn't until we recorded it in 83 for the Labour of Love album that uh, we then found out for publishing purposes yeah. that it was actually a Neil Diamond song. <laughs> and we weren't raving Neil Diamond fans by any stretch of the imagination. I but, mean, we knew his material, but we didn't know that song at all as a yeah. Neil Diamond song. Uh, but I remember around about that time, because I, I, I used to work with, uh, with a real thing, you know, and we all used to do like places like the Q Club in London. Mm -hmm. And you would find that whatever pop song came out, there'd be a reggae cover instantly. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, and... and well, there's been a fine tradition of that as long as I've been listening to Jamaican pop music, even before reggae, you know. Yeah. Um, the massive influence of American music on Jamaican pop music, because they're, they're listening to, um, or they were listening to, southern states american radio coming from miami and all the southern states you yeah. know florida uh, they would hear american music so they would immediately do a cover in their style yeah. you know and yeah. whether it was soul pop country a hell of a lot of country they were massive country fans jim reeves was an enormous star in jamaica um but, you know, they, they make their own music uh, traditionally and always have done. And they've always covered other artists. You know, yeah. the stuff they were hearing on the radio, they would immediately do either a ska or a, a rock steady or a reggae version of it. You yeah, know? yeah. OK, then. So let's go right back. Life stories. So you were born in Birmingham mm -hmm. to... Um, were your parents Irish? Of Irish no, Scottish. 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 Yeah, my Ian Campbell, wasn't it, you, your father? My father, Ian, uh, was born in Aberdeen. Um, and his father was an Aberdonian dock worker um, who couldn't get work eventually. They got, he was very active in the union, uh, the trade union. And um, he en ended up getting blacklisted and couldn't get work. So he came down to Birmingham looking for work. And I right. think my dad was... 13 when he came down here and uh, yeah grew, grew up here but there was a 
big tradition of folk music in our family. I was going to say, yeah, and, and he had this really, really successful folk group, didn't he? Mm -hmm. The Incumble Folk Group. Yeah, and a very successful folk club as well. He, he ran the, uh, um, or they ran, the Jugger Punch um, in Digbeth Civic Hall from the 60s. and. I mean, throughout the late 60s, early 70s, it was it was the biggest folk club in Europe, and um, everybody played there. And very often, the people that played there slept on our settee. You know, <laughs> um, so we were just surrounded by music and musicians yeah. from being toddlers. You know, so uh, there was always a musical influence. And I think my dad's dearest wish that we were all going to become part of his folk group as we got older. You know, if you showed any interest at all in uh, an instrument, you'd find one thrust in your hand within right. a couple of days. You know, right. he'd get one from somewhere. He had a collection of instruments anyway, and I think he hoped that you know that's what we were going to get into, become part of his thing. You know, what he was into, um, and of course. The opposite happened because children are generally diametrically opposed to whatever their parents are into. Yeah, okay. you know? <laughs> and uh, where we grew up in Balsall Heath, I was hearing Jamaican pop music from, I guess, at the age of about ten. I mean, before that, it was English pop music. You know, the the whole uh, English Mersey beat sound, the Liverpool bands, and yeah, all of yeah. that. You know, was, yeah. was uh, what I was listening to as a small kid. But uh, as soon as I started um, taking an interest in other music, what I was hearing everywhere where I lived was, uh, well, it's before reggae, it was sort of uh, Jamaican bebop and, um, and ska, mm. you know. And uh, Prince Buster, that was what I fell in love with when I was about 11 years old, right. you know. Um, and really from, from that age, I lost interest in what my dad was doing musically, even though, you know, I understood it and, and liked it. I just never wanted to be part of it. You know, yeah, I wanted yeah. to do something different. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, all I ever wanted to be was was a reggae musician. Really, when reggae happened in '67 for me, the summer of '67, I think, um, the sort of rock steady period that that 12, 18 month period of rock steady, I just fell in love with it. Mm. Never wanted to do anything else really. Just talked about, it still took me 10 years after that to, to join a band, you know, to form a band. But mm. um, yeah, that's all I ever wanted to do was play reggae. So, Much to my dad's chagrin. Because <laughs> I, I, you know, I often ask my guests, you know, especially if they're musicians, like where did the, the influences come from? So it's obviously it's from your parents. But I notice that um, all your other siblings are all right-handed, but you're a left hooker, aren't you? So's Ali, actually. Oh, and Ali's, yeah, yes. Yeah, there's yeah. two of us are left and right. two of us are right. So how did yeah. that come about? I don't know, that's genes, isn't it? Genetics, I don't know where it comes from. I don't know anybody else that was left-handed in our family. I might be completely wrong, there may be generations of them, but uh, as far as I know, there was only myself and Ali that were left-handed. Right, yeah, because that must have been a bit weird, sort of like, Oh, here's a guitar to play. Oh, hang on a minute. Yeah. Turn it upside down. Yeah, well, originally, when I first learned guitar, um, my uncle taught me, uh, my uncle who played in my dad's group, um, he taught me my first chords on a guitar, and I learned on an upside down guitar, you know, so I yeah. learned to play left handed, but with the guitar turned upside down. So, uh, you know, the bass strings were at the bottom, and <laughs> very strange, but you know. I, uh, I soon converted one in my teens and turned it around. Um, and then, of course, when I, f when I formed the band, I went out and bought my first electric guitar, and that was a left-handed uh, Fender Strat. Right, you still got it? Yeah. Still got my first precision. I'll tell you what happened with that <clears throat> guitar. It was, it was a really ugly sunburst color, and uh, I stripped it down to paint it, I wanted to paint it a different colour, you know, and uh, I put paint stripper on it, <laughs> terrible, I put paint stripper on it and stripped it all off and I'd taken the neck off and when I took the paint off with a scraper, underneath the paint was the name Campbell and I kept scraping and it said R. Campbell and then it said 1954, which was the year of my birth. Really? 
Yeah. And apparently, it was the guy who made the body. Yeah. It was a 1954 Strat, and the guy who made the body was R. Campbell, who worked in America. Wow. And they stamp yeah. under where the neck goes on, they stamp their name, the guy who's made the original body. And apparently, there was somebody called <laughs> R. Campbell in 1954 making left-handed strats. So Had it kind of felt like it? fate, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I painted it black and put it all back together again and um, I've still got it, yeah. Brilliant. Your, your older brother, David, was a guitarist. It, it is a folk sort of style guitarist? He plays all sorts of things. I think he plays the banjo and the guitar and he's all self-taught. Right. I didn't even know that he was playing guitar. We, we weren't together musically at all, you know. I mean, right. as kids, we all sang. Um, we sang close harmony and stuff, you know, but uh, I was never aware of, of David learning an instrument until I discovered that he was playing folk clubs. Wow. And, you know, yeah. and doing Appalachian mountain songs <laughs> and things, you know. Yeah. It's, he's got a eclectic taste David he plays all sorts of things and he still now plays plays the folk clubs yeah. yeah yeah so you got together then with a bunch of mates it's Brian Brian Travers mm -hmm. uh, and and the rest of the guys and, and he I know he said about he used to rehearse downstairs in in somebody's cellar underneath underneath his flat he's and Earl's uh, uh, both had a, a flats in this big Victorian house in uh, Trafalgar Road in Mosley and um, there was a cellar underneath that you got to from the garden and uh, Brian being an apprentice electrician had uh, knowledge of wiring and uh, <laughs> he rigged the wiring so that we didn't have to pay for it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> got to be done, hasn't it? <laughs> and so that became UB40. Yeah, it became our full-time job really because we talked about it for years since we were kids uh, and as I was telling you earlier when I went to see the Whalers we all went to see the Whalers I think I bought all the tickets because I was the only one working uh, but we all went to see the Whalers in 76 and I said to Ali at the time if you're ever serious about us being in a band this is what I want to play this right. is what I want to do right. and don't do it without me you know so that is, that's what happened really. It was Ali's social circle, uh, mostly kids that he'd gone to school with. Right. Uh, Jimmy Brown was in Duncan, Duncan went to school with them as well, so Jimmy was in Duncan's year. I think Earl and Brian and Ali were all in the same year. Um, we'd known Norman from childhood because mm. uh, he lived in the same area. So. It, it was a circle of mates, really, you right. know, and um, when Ali said, OK, we're serious, you know, that was what we did. Everyone who had a job gave it up, um, m although most of them didn't. Um, and we just, we treated it like a job, five days a week, Monday to Friday, morning to night. We just sat and learned to play together, right. sat and learned to play instruments, copied records, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, I was the only one that actually could play an instrument before the band started. Owen Bryan had had some sax lessons. Uh, everybody else was a complete novice. Right. So from scratch, they started by copying a few records. The first time we got together to rehearse, uh, it was so bad <laughs> and so anarchic, you know, because everybody was playing something different. And I was trying to get them all to play something together, you know. and. Uh, I just said, it's never going to happen, is it, guys? You know, you're all a bunch of idiots, and <laughs> it's never going to happen. And, and stormed off. And uh, Ali, Jimmy, Earl, uh, who you know were sort of you know bass, drums, and rhythm, they sat on their own for a couple of months and just learnt to become a, a rhythm section. You right. know? Uh, right. And when. Ali and Jimmy and Earl came to see me and said, look, you know, we're making music now, so are you interested? Do you want to come back, you know? And I, I said, I'll come and listen, <laughs> thinking it was never going to amount to anything, you know, still. And I went down, I was so surprised by how much they'd come on mm -hmm. in just a few months that I went, okay, I'm back in, you know, definitely. 
and from that point on we were making what sounded something like music right was it bob lamb who recorded your first yeah first album yeah we did a deal with uh, graduate records which was david veer who owned a record shop in west brom i think um and he'd had a couple of independent record successes he had a couple of records in the charts with local bands um and he came to us and offered us a 50 50 deal you know we'd we'd had all sorts of offers from major labels and minor labels but uh, we turned them all down because they wouldn't give us the points we wanted and they wouldn't give us complete artistic control you right know? yeah um david veer came to us and said i'll pay for the recording of your album and you can give me whatever you want whatever you want i'll sell it you know right and we went that's the kind of deal we want <laughs> yeah. and he said and i'll split it with you 50 50. so fantastic we went from having rubbish offers to a brilliant offer uh, and yeah, he, he went to Bob Lamb right. and said, um, I've got this band and there were eight of us and we had to record in a, a room, a bed sit, you know, Bob mm. Lamb didn't have a studio. He had a home studio yeah. that he'd, he'd more or less financed from being in the Steve Gibbons band, you know, uh, and touring with The Who, I think. Um, so he would built himself a little studio, but it was only eight track and we were an eight piece band and yeah. eight tracks were taken up by the drums you know yeah. so we um he hired another eight track and linked them together and uh, we just did everything by overdubbing by mixing down yeah. onto two yeah. and then recording again and then yeah. mixing down and um that was our first you know real proper time spent in a studio we'd done a couple of demo things we did one in steel palsy studio in Brist on bristol street um but that was our first real go in a studio, you know. Right. It was great fun, but uh, but the mixing was hilarious because it was it was eight pairs of hands on <laughs> yeah, you know, well, everything. I've, I've been there. Yeah, of course. There. Yeah, <laughs> them, them were the days. They don't know they're born nowadays, nope. do they? <laughs> and it was a hit. It was mm. a massive hit, wasn't it? Yeah, and ha yeah, it was, uh, and something to do with Chrissy, really, the Pretenders, you know, because. Because we hadn't even recorded, we hadn't finished. We were we were recording, but we hadn't finished the album. Um, we were still working on it when Chrissy heard us play in a in a pub in London. I think the Hope and Anchor, or it might have been the Hundred Club, but it was one of those mm -hmm. bar clubs, you know. Uh, and it was our first little mini tour of London, and she had a number one album and a number one single, and was about to go out on a sold out UK tour. And she saw us at this club and said, do you want to come on tour with me? So from doing up maybe 30 gigs in the previous 12 months, which mm. was our entire uh, experience, you know, we suddenly did 32 gigs in six weeks or something. You yeah, know? yeah. Uh, so we doubled our experience in six weeks. But while we were on that tour, we released one of the tracks that was finished off the album. Uh, and it went into the top 10 mm. because Obviously, her audience was a sold out tour and her audience were, were record buying public. So, all of a sudden, we had an audience that went out and bought our record. So, with, while we were on the tour, by the time we finished the tour with, with Chrissy, we had a top 10 record, which was pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. And it never kind of looked back, really. We, we did Top of the Pops, we you know, uh, released another one. We had, I think, probably five. Uh, five top 10 records in the first couple of years and then of course we did the labor of love mm. which gave us our first number one you know but that whole thing was over a three-year period and it just it just accelerated over that period you yeah, know? yeah yeah what do you do so you you were saying before you you constantly touring at the minute mm -hmm. I mean obviously uh, everybody knows about the problems so I'm not going to dwell on those um, just wish everybody luck. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you are doing a new album. Yeah. And also you're doing some gigs towards the end of the year, aren't you? Yeah, we're, we're doing some UK dates. We're, we're going to go back into uh, some of the arenas. We're going to play what used to be called the NEC and is now, I think, the Genting Arena. Genting Arena, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we're going back and playing that, yeah. It's, uh, it's taken us a while to sort of... Um, get back to playing arenas really 
since Ali left, we had to prove ourselves, I guess, to yeah. promoters and yeah. agents, etc. You know, we're definitely going to go back and play the big venues, but mix it up, play some small ones as well, because yeah. we love playing the smaller venues. Yeah, no, it's Our fans nice. love us playing the smaller venues yeah. because the atmosphere is always so, yeah. so much more uh, intimate, you know. Um, you can see the whites of each other's eyes. Yeah. And, uh, Nothing it's, like it's, it. It, no, it's just so much more fun to play smaller venues, you know, yeah, yeah. more cosy, intimate venues. So we will still be doing some of those just because we love doing it. But they're, it's hard to make them pay, you know, with, with such a big band. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're going to do some, some big ones as well. So Brilliant. mix it up with a new album. So Robin, it's fun. been fascinating talking to you. <laughs> Short and sweet. <laughs> Time flies, doesn't it? Yeah. Could be here all day. Thanks so much for coming in. Absolute pleasure, Des. Yes.